it is a little difficult for me to speak on the subject of corruption largely because it tends to be phrased in the negative. I tend to have a preference to speak about accountability. I remember reading once, I think it was Mother Teresa who said, if you're going to invite me to an anti-war protest, I'm not going to come. But if you invite me to a peace concert, I will be there. <laughs> but the truth is that the door to fixing corruption for me is accountability. But the title has been set and I'm going to work with it today. Now, I just want you to take a look at that. I'm sorry your screen is not as lovely as the one I'm looking at here. But the question that's really been posed to all of us tonight is what is she worth to you? What is Jamaica worth to you? What does she mean? She has nourished us. She has nurtured us. She has done so much for us. The question now is what are we going to do for her? Now, in thinking and wrapping my mind around the thoughts I wanted to share tonight, three words kept coming back to me. It's the people and their perspectives, the problem, and the possibilities, and that's the beauty of it. When you have a problem, there is always room for possibilities to be extracted from that tonight. And in as much as I've really always enjoyed coming to talks like this, I have to admit that by the time I wrapped my head around the problem, I kind of leave looking like this. <laughs> so I'm really hoping tonight that I can offer some hope and that we will be encouraged by what I believe is an idea that JAMP will be bringing to the people of Jamaica. Now, it was a little presumptuous of me to think that I could possibly wrap just my head around the question about corruption, the impact, and whether or not we can make a dent into it. So a friend challenged me to head out on the streets of Jamaica and to talk to other Jamaicans about what they thought. And that is why we started People and Their Perspectives. Yeah? And I thought it would be really good to share with you. I talked to about 18 people over the last six days, you know, the security guard at the bank, the cashier at the local hardware, three teenagers down in the food court at Sovereign, and it was profound. And I wouldn't be able, in the interest of time, to get into it with you, but these were the questions that I asked them. When you hear the word poverty, what comes to mind? And when you hear the word corruption, not just what comes to mind, but how does it make you feel? And then I asked, do you think we're ever going to be able to make a dent in this problem? And I was pleasantly surprised. I think I'm going to have to change my company because I went on the street expecting not much hope. But with the 18 Jamaicans I spoke to, only two persons thought that there wasn't a chance. I said, yes, Jeanette, you're going to have to change the company you're keeping. And then I asked, is there any contribution that you can make? And last but by no means least, what do you think corruption is? Because we really do have a difference of opinion as to what this is. And it was a fascinating engagement. So I'm going to share a few with you before I get into the statistics, as Pat said. Not having an ID, well, that took me aback immediately. What does he mean? Poverty means not having an ID. And then he elaborated. Well, when you don't have an ID, you know, ma'am, police call you boy. But when you have an ID, you become sir. It was about respect, and he saw poverty as a lack of respect. I get goosebumps still, just reflecting on it. When I asked him about corruption, he had one word. Government. The second person I spoke to said Riverton. That too surprised me. So I said to him, do you mean the shelter or the waste management problem? And these were his words. When you're looking at the people living off the waste generated by the city, you must be looking at poverty. And I thought, what a definition. Exactly. He turned out to be a 28-year-old university graduate who had grown up in the inner city thanks to his grandmother and education now is working and doing well, employed, and wants to be a politician. Amazing. <laughs> You're welcome, Pat. <laughs> and he said to me, the only thing stopping him is his wife says, I'm not marrying no priest, no pastor, and no politician. But he's planning to call her bluff, he says. When he thinks of corruption, he says, my money comes to mind. I said to him, really? He said, every time I hear the story, I think, my money. An 18-year-old in ninth grade said to me, she thinks of hunger, especially when you cannot feed children. And for her, corruption was just plain ugliness, just government in control. Yeah. One person in Burger King said to me, it's a mind thing, it's not your pocket, it's your attitude. No gentle pokes, there are books written about this. Wayne Dyer, books upon books upon books, and he grasped this in a way that I thought was just 
Wish I could tell you how the rest of that conversation went. I spoke to a policeman at Kingston Night Market last week, Tuesday, and he says every time he hears the word, it's disappointment, which in and of itself is not a bad thing because that's a function of expectation, which means he still has hope. But the words that followed was, it's everywhere, ma'am. And it makes me wonder if it's going to be me sometimes soon. He had been in, in, on duty in Kingston for one year, and based on what he saw, he thought that it was pretty much omnipresent, and it was a matter of time before he got caught up in corruption. Now, my last was a gentleman who I thought was a young business executive, not looking very different from Dr. Haldane. So I thought, great. A broad cross-section of people. Let me hear it from somebody who is, you know, a little bit more. And he said to me, poverty is when a gunman robs you of everything, everything you have at six years old. Now, you know we tend to judge off appearance, and I was guilty of doing it. So I thought, at six years old, you got robbed. The gunman broke in and what, stole your Nintendo? I'm not kidding. These are the things that came to mind. And then he said, no, it was my father. And I was really struck. He grew up in Jonestown with a grandmother and only had a father. And gunmen came in and killed his father in front of him. Now, you know that totally through the conversation of work. And he said corruption for him represented politicians and the gunman because them youth that can't buy food, so how on earth can they buy guns and bullets? And that's the last one I will share with you, but I'm happy to tell you that he had three siblings. They've all done exceptionally well. He just, la he just helped the last one through NCU nursing. But he said the one good thing that came out of it was the fact that he met his mother for the first time. Of course, you know, I cheered up at hearing that, but then only to hear that she was mentally ill, walking the road naked. The day after his father died, they took him to meet his mother. But he is an overcomer, and he has done a marvelous job of overcoming, and I'm sure if time allowed me to share more of that conversation with you, you would understand a little bit more of the resilience of the Jamaican people. Now, that is looking at it from the, thank you, Pat, from the perspective of the Jamaicans on the street, but every single one of them, except for two, knew that there was hope and actually told me of the things that they were doing to fight corruption in their community and in their families and in their homes. Before I segue to the next slide, I'm going to just give you a little insight into the gentleman. He says he has an eight-year-old son, and what he did in March was to sit him down in front of the budget debate with a dictionary and walked away and told him to listen. Isn't that amazing? But that is the beginning of turning this thing around. Now, I want to look at the perspective of another Jamaican. Her name is Mrs. Pamela Monroe Ellis. You would know her as the Auditor General of Jamaica, who I think has been doing a marvelous job very quietly in her own space. <laughs> now, as I've segued to the problem, naturally, I'm going to look at a couple of the reports and a little bit of a snippet so that we can just focus our mind on the nature and the depth of the problem that we're having. These are actually highlights from a body of research that I did with the Jamaica Civil Society Coalition in partnership with the Caribbean Vulnerable Communities Coalition in 2016. And it's actually the findings of that report that has actually given birth to the work that I'm doing now and the organization that has been founded to take the findings of that report a little bit further. Now, <laughs> this is a... I call it the Auditor General scrapbook, but if you look at the headlines, and usually when I have time, I would ask persons in the audience to guess when were these articles written, and invariably it never passed more than about five years. But if you take a look, yes, wow indeed. It's really stunning, and I'm not, a, I'm not shy to tell you it's not changing. If I were to read the details of that 1958 report on the parish accounts, that's pre-independence, it wouldn't sound any different from the Auditor the General's reports looking at the local governments today. That Bellevue report in 1991, we have one as recently as 10 years after, nothing has changed, but it will change. And I want to take you on a little bit of a journey to some of the highlights of what is happening, what she's sharing with us, and the question about what have we been doing with this work that this Watchdog Agency has actually been extracting a, a lot of value in terms of um, how we handle governance and how we handle ourselves and our money. Now, here we have an example in 2014 where $1.78 billion, and you are all aware of the problems you're having with water right now. $1.78 billion was transferred from a K-Factor account. To keep it short, the K-Factor account can only be utilized for pumps 
and pipes, not for light and water and paying salaries. Now, you can't remove from that account without the OUR's approval. $1.78 billion was removed. And when the Auditor General went and audited, she could only find $72 million in receipts. In 2015, we borrowed $8.6 billion in the middle of a time when we were tightening our belts with the IMF. The HAJ, HA sorry, we borrowed from China. We contracted with China. The project began. We were supposed to provide 2,517 lots, 900, sorry, 937 units, yes. 2,517 lots. It started, the contract was signed. No feasibility studies were done. The designs were incomplete. Naturally, that means overruns of money and time. But take a look at that. At the end, when the Auditor General went in, 867 units, that's over 90%, were incomplete, and 21% of the lots were, but all funds were already paid out to the contractor. Institute of Sports, this is a matter of governance. We cannot put a figure on some of these because we can't tell how much leakage. But in 23 years, the Institute of Sports has never submitted a financial statement to the government. Every year, they are allocated funds, and not once in 23 years have they ever said to the government, this is what we have done with the funds. You will notice it says that the audit committee has never met. The Ports Authority, some of us are more familiar with this. It's as recent as 2017. A senior officer benefited from three pensions. You see the value. And a gratuity <laughs> totaling $31.33 million. Would anybody like to guess what I'm going to say for 2018, last year? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> you are so wrong. <laughs> I thought because that has been so well ventilated, I would show you why it is that we really need to pay attention. Because only a couple of months before we heard about Petrodam, the newspaper carried the National Insurance Fund. Now, everybody knows we take NIS, and this is for all of us, yeah? It's a social security. This is one of the most vulnerable parts of the population. But in 2018, $3.1 billion was invested by the National Insurance Fund without any due diligence, without any due process. Not only that, but the investment committee never approved it, the board never gave approval, and neither did the Ministry of Finance. Now, can anybody tell me how we spend $3.1 billion without that level of gateway review? And everybody's still sitting at their desks and working, what, some 15 months later? Yeah. Last, but by no means least, just last month, I think this might have gone over our heads because it was the same week that the state of emergency was reinstated in St. James, but we had the Jamaica Constabulary Force where $1.8 billion was spent over two years and 81% of those contracts was just about me saying, hey, can you provide meals for us? No tenders, hey, how much will it cost to repair the cars and maintain the offices? Here's a contract, $1.8 billion. Now, I'm hoping that gives you an idea of just a snippet of the things that the Auditor General is saying to the country, but we have not been paying sufficient attention. I'm gonna close this section by sharing with you a quotation from a public accounts member of the committee. He said, and I saw this in a transcript, we can't have the repetition of this kind happening every year. It just continues in department after department. And if you were to add it up, you will know that you cannot run GMMB like that. <laughs> you would never. He says, I would not run my business like that. And that's the point. It's not our funds, so therefore the way in which we make decisions is a little bit or a lot lighter than it should have been. Now, when I went to study, I had, as Kim shared with you, I had spent quite a bit of time in the joint venture well, in joint venture with the Ministry of Housing, it's a partnership between the public sector and the private sector at the time to provide more middle-income housing. But once I started studying, I fell in love with infrastructure. I moved from housing to infrastructure because I realized that infrastructure is not just about the economics of what it does for our country, but it's a moral obligation that we have because light and water are life and death issues. The ability to drive from your home to a hospital in under half an hour 
is a life and death issue. So it became about a moral obligation that we have to provide quality public goods and services. Now, every one of us in this room depended on public goods and services even before we were born. From the day you were in the womb, that care that your mother had, whether she had to go to a prenatal clinic for the government, you were already dependent on the quality goods and services that the government supplies. And this is why corruption really, it's something that I get passionate about. It's not an abstract term. It really is about the quality of lives of everybody in here and everything that we can do to correct that is going to be worth our time and energy. But what is corruption? One of the things I found by being on the street is that there were persons who really didn't have the, the correct understanding of what it was. A gentleman looked at me and said, well, Mom, it's not when you steal out of need, you know, it's just when you steal out of greed. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> and there was a gentleman who said to me, well, it's not when you thief some ketchup if you work down a grace. So there are all different kinds of ideas as to what it is. Very basically, it's the abuse of public office for private gain. That is how it is referred to internationally, but I'm gonna be honest with you. I like the way it's defined in the Corruption Prevention Act of Jamaica. It says when a public official solicits or accepts, whether directly or indirectly, an article or money, and that's very important. A lot of persons tend to associate it only with money. A benefit being a gift, a favor, a promise, or an advantage, and it doesn't have to be for yourself if it's a friend or a family. And then there's the other thing that's very interesting. It's also about not just what you do, but it's also about what you don't do. And that happens a lot. It's when you turn your head, when there is something happening there that you should be looking at and you should be reporting. Now that's what corruption is. Now, as it relates to the cost of corruption, we're gonna start first by looking at the impact. Transaction costs for those coming into Jamaica to do business. Now, when I speak about transaction costs, let's use a house, for example. You might think it's just the price of the house, but no, it's actually all the costs that you will face in buying that house. So it's the cost of the attorney, maybe the realtor, maybe if you had to ask a cousin to fly down and look at the house, basically it's everything that you have to do to actually get this business done. So just picture for a minute a housing developer. I'm gonna stay in my lane for where I'm comfortable. And there's so much interface between somebody wanting to do a development in housing here between that businessman and the public sector, the public official. And at every step of the way to get licensing, to get permitting, to get approvals, that is where the opportunity presents itself for corruption. And what we have come to understand is that as long as it takes too much time and there are too many steps involved in the bureaucracy, then it increases the likelihood that frustration is going to build and people who don't even want to be corrupt are gonna find themselves in a position where they might. So it increases the cost of doing business because people begin to let off. And the difficulty for persons coming into Jamaica is that Businessmen like predictability in cost. They like to know what they're gonna anticipate. Now, believe it or not, there are some countries where they know ahead of time exactly what they're going to have to pay under the table, yeah? In Jamaica, there's a sliding scale, right? You never know who, you never know when. But it makes it very difficult, so that's the first thing, the unpredictability. The second thing is that it distorts what we call sectoral priorities. Now, there's always this rustling at the time of the budget about how much is gonna go into social programs versus how much is going to go into capital spending. Where do you think most of the corruption occurs? Capital. So, there is the peddling of influence sometimes by the businessman who is anticipating that there's gonna be more put into capital, not just because the country needs infrastructure, because there's gonna be an opportunity for him to benefit. Another is what we call the privatization of public policy. Now, most of us are familiar with the idea of privatization of public assets. But in this case, you will have a situation where laws are passed or not passed in the interest of private businesses. I don't know if you're familiar with the term beneficial ownership. But Jamaica did something really significant, I believe it was in 2017, when we amended the law that prevented business people from hiding behind a veil of anonymity. We need to know 
when the funds are being generated in a company, who is benefiting ultimately? And you could register a company, you would have Dr. Haldane Johnson as the legal owner, and you would never know that Jeanette Calder is actually benefiting from that income. Can you begin to see how that would create an environment that facilitates illegitimate businesses? Well, in 2017, we removed that, preventing it. And this is one of the things that I would want to applaud the government for, because that would have been a law that would have facilitated all kinds of evil, but we've kind of cauterized that at the moment. La well, not last, but the next one is antisocial behaviors. I don't have to spend any time on that. We're all pretty familiar with how corruption leads to crime and violation of human rights. Bribery, nepotism, cronyism. We tend to look at the statistics in terms of a dollar value. But the moral fabric of Jamaica is being impacted in a way that is very disturbing. I'll share with you that during the last election, one of the things that disappointed me was how little we talked about the social concerns of Jamaica vis-a-vis -vis the pocket concerns of Jamaicans. But I don't think this is something I need to elaborate on. We see it cropping up in a number of the Auditor General's reports, even in dealing with Petrojam. My concern, if I give you a simple example, is if when you're in the traffic and you see that taxi man who overtakes all of us to get ahead, after a couple of taxi men, what do you see happening? A private. You just notice all of a sudden, now, why should I sit here if he can? And I'm convinced that that is not limited to just how we drive on the road. The minute you begin that creeping compromise, it begins to show up in other aspects of your life. And that is why I'm particularly concerned about that impact. Reduced tax collection. Every single development report that you read will tell you that when you go to a country that's having a problem with governance and corruption, look at the tax collection. There's a direct relationship between the two, and that I'm sure is the case here for us here in Jamaica. And last, overriding regulation. Hmm. Building codes, environmental controls, prudent banking regulations, and taxation. I believe they say that there are four main categories where we're running into trouble. Basically, when you overregulate, you think you're trying to do good. You're trying to police the activity of private citizens. But when you do that, what do you think is also happening? When you have layers and layers of more steps and more passages about how you can do business, exactly, you got to find a shortcut. So the four areas where this tends to, to turn up is in taxation, is in business startups, how long it takes you to get that done, in licensing, and in property registration. So those are some of the main ones I wanted to share with you in terms of the impact that it is having. Now, it is all about influence peddling that there are members of the private sector, private citizens, who have a kind of access that facilitates the kind of flow, on money, flow of money that denies us in terms of the quality goods and services that we can provide. Now, I just wanted to quickly give us a case study to let us know, guys, we can do this. There are countries around the world that are doing far worse than we are in governance that's moving ahead in leaps and bounds. Now, I don't know if you follow the case of the car wash scandal, but it started in 2016. And Dilma Rousseff was actually impeached. She wasn't impeached because of the scandal. Time does not permit me to go into the details, but it was massive impropriety in terms of contracts that were being signed, big contracts, many, many companies benefiting, and it wasn't limited to just this country. It actually ricocheted throughout the entire Latin America. It actually brought on a recession in some countries. Now, Dilma ended up impeached, not so much because of the scandal, but they had legislation. Now, people scoff a lot at legislation as if we have enough. But we've actually been passing some in Jamaica, and I'm going to speak to it quickly in a minute. That's going to be making a hell of a difference as it relates to corruption, if we know about it. If we know about it. Now, this was actually what we call the fiscal responsibility laws that determined how Brazil borrowed and how Brazil spent. And basically what the president did was, to put it in basic terms, she cooked the books so that it would look a little bit better as she was going into an election. Now, thanks to the, what would be the Auditor General of Brazil, she was able to share what she found coming out of an audit, which ended up in Dilma stepping down. And then went Lula da Silva, who ended up getting 12 years in prison. Now, that's a former president. So when you think about big man can't go to jail, it certainly can't be done if the will is there. And when I talk about will, 
I'm not really referring to political will. I have a theory that whatever becomes public will translates into political will. Can I get a clap on that one? Thank you very much, Pat. Interestingly enough, they had an election in January, and they have a new president, and everybody thought, well, okay, new president comes in, maybe the pursuit of justice would end. No, not at all. Last month, Michelle Timmer also was arrested and is about to apparently go down, and he's disappeared also. Now, if you take a quick look at this picture, this is what Brazil's presidents have at their access. Three palaces, planes, helicopters. That's a lot to throw at an individual. Very compelling. And I can assure you that there are inducements and enticements that come to them way beyond. Now, I don't know about the average human being, but what I think is that we ought to have systems in place that don't leave presidents and the public officials relying on, well, how well did your mother raise you? But we should have mechanisms that are triggered immediately as certain things go wrong. Now, Jamaica, hmm. I'm going to leave the impact with the statistics in terms of the impact of corruption. Jamaica's gross domestic product, the last time it was measured, was 14.8 billion US dollars. And I've heard Metro Siaga sharing a figure, 734 million US dollars is what we lose every year to corruption. And I've wondered where Metro got this. And then by coincidence, I discovered. Because if the statistics say that Developing countries in particular lose between 5% to 20% of their GDP every year. Well, I said, okay, let's calculate it and see how Jamaica is doing. Now, when you calculate 14.8 billion, and when you take 5%, now if I ask for a raise of hands, if it's between 5 and 20%, do you think J J Jamaica would be at the low end of the threshold of corruption? <laughs> Well, I, I am a woman of generous spirit, so I worked with the 5%, and it actually turned out to be 94.6 billion Jamaican dollars, which is roughly what that 734 US that Metro was referring to. Now, can I just pause for a minute and ask you to think about, Prince, what we could do with 94.6 billion dollars every single year. Bobby, you would have that port ready. Long time, absolutely. Matter of fact, gentle folks, if we cut that in half, we would still be building schools and hospitals. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine what this country would look like. Do you understand then the extent of the problem? And don't you wonder where this money is going? Yes, we do. Well, follow me. My take on it is that the environment in Jamaica is actually very, very ripe for change. And so I'm going to share with you a list, and I'm going to ask you not to just look at it one by one, but just step back and look at the entire list and see if you wouldn't come to the same conclusion that I am coming to. Let us start with one of the things that I think we definitely have going for us, which I think we're underestimating. Legislation. Just two examples. The access to information legislation has been around. How long now, Doc? 20 years. 20? 20 years, two decades. Can I see a show of hands of how many Jamaicans in the room have actually utilized that act in order to get information? Just a show of hands. Wow, guys, this is not more than 10. Not more than 10. This is a piece of legislation where everything that I've shown you coming out of the Auditor General's reports, if you simply wanted to know Anything more about it? Did you know that you could simply write to a government agency and say, I would like documentation to substantiate what has been done to remedy this breach? This is a tool that the government of Jamaica has placed in the hands of citizens. And yet, in a room that I really believe have an investment here and here in the subject, we could only find 10. The, in, the environment is riper than we think it is. FRF there stands for Fiscal Responsibility Framework. And time does not permit me, but ever since we entered into the standby agreement with the IMF, Jamaica has been doing amazing things in terms of tightening up the controls that are going to prevent us from so easily moving to the place where we were, where every time we earned a dollar, 
we actually owed a dollar forty. I still cannot wrap my head around that. Now, can I get an applause for the fact that every time we now earn a dollar, we, we are what? We're only paying back what now? 96 cents. Yeah, that's amazing. That is amazing. That is amazing. And uh, we owe a lot of that to legislation. All right, so that's one. And there's a lot more in terms of the legislative framework that started with Dr. Peter Phillips and that has continued with Shaw and now Dr. Clark. And I just want to say, in my studies, one of the biggest challenges for developing countries has been policy discontinuity. Yeah? Basically means, uh, here's a good idea, and this party was doing with it, and another one come in and forget about that. It speaks to the maturity and how much we have evolved, and it's really something that I am immeasurably grateful for, to the political leaders for. I really am. I really am. Now, information is what's going to turn this country around. I, I kid you not, because that's what's working in all the other countries where they are turning corruption around. So the fact that there is press freedom, the majority of the things that I showed you happening in Jamaica, you could get that from the newspaper if you are paying attention. I believe it is the Paris organization called Something Without Borders, it's slipping me now, that, ha that rates countries, 100 countries around the world. And Jamaica, where do you think Jamaica is? Where one is the best, 100 is the worst. We are in the top eight on the planet for freedom to access information, including the press. <laughs> Absolutely. The environment is ripe. Oversight agencies, there is a plethora. And maybe because we have gotten so used to hearing about it, we assume this is something just every country just has. That's not true. Auditor General, Contractor General, MOCA, CTOC, Indicom, DPP, Public Defender, Public Accountability Inspectorate. How many have ever heard of the Public Accountability Inspectorate? One, two, three, four, five, six. And yet every government official that has been removed from their jobs in the last 15 years, it was based on reports generated by a department in the Ministry of Finance known as the Public Accountability Inspectorate. The Bank of Jamaica governor, the student loan director, I do believe even the president of UTEC, and I'm forgetting the fourth. Those are high public officials, so who says we can't hold people to account? Yeah. Fourth is parliamentary oversight. You have been watching and seeing the tenacity of the Public Accounts Committee and the PAAC. There's a different shift. I have been watching them for years. And I know it's Petrojam, but I don't think it's just Petrojam. Have you seen the reports I shared with you that have been going on for decades? Ah, uh, so it's not about Petrojam in and of itself. The environment is ripe for change. Now, the other thing about parliamentary oversight is that Jamaica can actually listen while it is happening. In Trinidad and Tobago, the citizens of the country don't know what's happening in chamber because that's where it's discussed, in chamber. Do not underestimate the fact that we can now turn on our computers or our television and see the debate for ourselves. That is a very, very powerful access to information. Robust civil society, and when I, when I talk about laying the foundations, JAMP will be standing on the foundation for the work of many, many CSO, civil society organizations that came before. Too many to list, but Jamaicans for Justice, the Jamaica Civil Society Coalition, the Jamaica Environmental Trust, National Integrity Action, which has been doing an amazing work. But when I speak of robust civil society, I'm not just stopping there. Let's not forget things like EPOC. Pat, you say you believe in partnership. That is an amazing partnership that the International Monetary Fund says is unique to Jamaica. And if they could replicate that around the world, what could they do to turn the other countries around? And that's amazing. It's amazing. That's amazing. That's 11 Jamaicans who work full-time assisting the government to steer them through, which, wo which was one of the most difficult periods of our nation's history, financially speaking. Number five, our development partners. There's a lot happening in the space when it comes on to development partners, but I'm gonna level with, level with you and tell you the truth. Sometimes there are things we need to get done, and if enough people outside are tell us to get it done, it don't happen. But it means that there's a value to be placed on partnership. 
There's a lot that's moving right now in the IMF and in the G7, the G20 countries as it relates to corruption. And I do believe that Barbados, Bahamas, and another country have had to change their legislation about the same beneficial ownership. The pressure is brought to bear from the outside. Things happen on the inside. Number seven is technology. I live in an era where at the press of a button, I can speak to the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Now, there was so much happening in my father and my grandfather's time. Far more, I would say, investment in the future of the country. And yet, they didn't have it as easy as I think we have it to engage our political leaders. Yeah? Technology is the way of the future. And I think that's, as I'm going to show you in a few minutes, how JAMP is planning to harness that for the benefit of um, accountability. And last, but by no means least, self-driven, I call them the intrepid generation of young Jamaicans that are here with us. I'm counting on them to harness everything that is present here and to assist us in moving Jamaica forward. Now, would you agree with me that this is a really positive look at what can happen? Yeah, it is. The question is, how have we been leveraging the opportunities and these tools that the politicians, our governments, have given to us? Now, let's talk about the possibilities. What is JAMP and this accountability toolbox that we are hoping will contribute to the conversation that's been ongoing about change? Now, JAMP has three tools that it wants to offer. We have dubbed one the accountometer. Another one is the MP tracker, and the third one is a legislative tracker. And in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the accountometer, because that one deals more specifically with the issue at hand. Now, the accountometer is, in essence, dealing with the issue of accountability. I have a very, very simple theory about how we can really turn this issue of corruption around, and that is if we focus on accountability. When I was young, my brother used to ask me, of all the superpowers, which one do you want, Jeanette? And my answer was always the same. I want to be invisible. It was just so obvious why that would be the coolest thing in the world. But that is the very same characteristic about corruption that is making it so difficult and intractable. There is nobody who is acting corruptly, who is leaving minutes behind of the conversation we've just had. There are no breadcrumbs like Hansel and Gretel showing the DPP how to make her way to the culprits, right? And just about every time the contractor general has submitted a report with a recommendation that somebody be prosecuted, what is the response from the DPP? I have no material evidence to prosecute, and she will never. So I am proposing to Jamaica that we turn our sights on respect for rules and procedure and policy. It's very simple. If you go down to Ligony right now, there's a hardware store and there's a sign that says, if you are caught taking a tip, you will be dismissed on the spot. If it was government, we would put up CCTV, we would do investigations, we would have a long route and we probably wouldn't end up firing in anybody. That hardware has decided that there is something they want to preserve in the relationship with their customers and even with the staff and they realize that the environment is of such that if you start to take money, for taking the things to your car, then you're going to start to lose something that you hold dear. I am saying to you, Jamaica, that if we have rules and regulations about how we contract goods and services from the private sector, if you are caught going contrary to that, then you should be held accountable. There should be zero tolerance for breaking the rules, because guess what? That's the only way you're going to be corrupt. It's simple. How do you spend $3.1 billion without approval from the Ministry of Finance, from your board, and you're still at your desk. Did you realize that after that happened, the Ministry of Finance announced that we are actually going to have to raise NIS because in 2029, that fund is going to be in trouble? They raised it already. It was in last year, December. I heard the announcement, and the Auditor General reported in it in February. Now, the Financial Investigation Division is supposed to be investigating, and it has been 15 months, Jamaica. Right? So my take on it is that let us start with the rule breakers. Wherever that is happening, we demand accountability. Now what JAMP is going to be doing is to giving us, 
using the access to information as the main tool. And you can have the right to access information, but you can't get information. I'm telling you, Jamaica does a really surprisingly good job with data. I say it because I have had to find data out of Jamaica, and it's so much more harder than you'd imagine. The next thing is that we want to make it understandable. It don't make sense you can access information, but the people cannot understand it. And the fourth is that we also want to give you access to the accountable officers. Have you ever been in a situation where you read the information in the paper, and you really want to do something about it, but you just don't know who to talk to? And even if you knew who to talk to, you wouldn't know Prince how to access them. Well, this is really the pathway to change that JAMP is taking, and I just want to give you a little bit of a glimpse as to what the tool will look like and how it will operate. What we have here is basically, the portal is a website. It's a user-friendly, citizen-centric website that is not only going to be used by all the citizens here, but also members of government like the Public Accounts Committee, the Auditor General herself, the Cabinet Office, because there is no tracking mechanism in government that tells us how we are doing with remedying these breaches that the watchdog agencies so faithfully report on. This is basically the, and it's very, I, I hope you can see, a very robust search engine. And if you see here, it says view all breaches. Every Jamaican coming to this site would be able to click there. And at this point in time, we are tracking 47 breaches. That's where we're starting. Now, just for the sake of the presentation, I had typed in the ministry, or I selected the ministry, economic growth and job creation. And if you look to the right, you will see that 12 results would pop up. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to do it live due to internet connectivity, so I'm going to use screenshots. 12 results would pop up. And if the citizen clicked on this one, which says, wow, look at that, it says NWC 1.78 billion missing from the K factor account. You'll recall that from the couple of slides ago. So if you wanted to know a little bit more about that, especially in light of the drought conditions and you're really upset, it would take you to a page which would have a small blurb, tell you which ministry that agency reports to. There are lots of agencies that don't report to the ministries you thought it would report to. So NWC reports to economic growth and job creation. And what we have here is a meter because JAMP is not just planning to monitor Kim, we're planning to measure. Now, that data is gonna come from the Auditor General's findings, which is very simply laid out, so we've crunched down an entire report into a couple paragraphs. And very importantly, we would like you to be able to share this in the social media space, so those buttons will be there now. In terms of accountability, we know it's the NWC, but most people in here who couldn't tell me who the Permanent Secretary of the NWC is. And what most Jamaicans don't know is that it is the permanent secretary that is the accountable officer, not the minister. So it will indicate who the permanent secretary is at present that is responsible for correcting the breach. But we thought in fairness, Donna, we would have to explain who the permanent secretary was at the time of the breach. <laughs> in fairness, in fairness. And to the right, it tells you the breach category. This is a resource management issue and further unsupported decision. Now, when you scroll down, this is where I think it becomes a little bit more useful. The breach details that you see here reports on the current status. This is something that JAMP is progressively checking out on. The year it was reported, the last time JAMP assessed it, and the year it will be resolved because they're well on their way to fixing this. This would contain the recommendation from the Auditor General or the Public Accounts Committee or the Cabinet, and here you would find JAMP's update. And right now, I'm very pleased to let you know that using that same Access to Information Act, we can report that the National Water Commission has paid back $1.775 billion to the account. <laughs> Absolutely. It does happen. So we are tracking to make sure they pay the next $151 million. <laughs> On the right, we have more recent breaches. When you come to the page, you would actually be able to be pulled in a little bit more to find out what else JAMP is doing. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on articles and reports, but what that is is another level of information. All the reports coming out of this issue will be present at your fingertips. We would have extracted for you from the Auditor General's reports so you don't have to go look for it. And if the contractor general had followed up with a report of their own, 
it would also be on that page. Extracts will be taken from the sessions in Parliament that specifically address the discussions of this sitting so that you can easily find out a little bit more details about how this occurred. And this is the page that I'm a little bit more excited about. So you move from the breach details to the articles and reports, and this is where we reveal who is in charge and give you access to information about how you can talk to them about what you just learned regarding that $1.78 billion. Now, you have the chairman, you have the president, you have the most honorable Andrew Holness, who is the minister responsible for water, and you have the permanent secretary. You're living in a time where you can read, digest, be fully informed, and at the click of a button, Jamaica, you can begin to engage the accountability officer in the space where you can have other citizens now becoming aware of it. Sounds like a plan? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And last, but by no means least, if you follow the train of thought, this is really accountability. From here to there, you get the information, you know who the officers are, you engage them, and that tab says call to action. And basically, that is any other citizens group who feels that there is something they want to do about this. They will get in touch with JAMP, you will let us know whether it's a protest, whether it's a town hall meeting, or whether it's just a letter publicly to the Prime Minister that you would have written in the papers, but you want it to be present and associated with the breach, Jamp will post that for you so you can share it and garner more support from other citizens. <laughs> Last but by no means least, not only would you be able to come to this site and find out what's specifically happening with the NWC, but where it says Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation is actually a live link which would take you to the page of the ministry itself. So you would have been able to understand how the NWC is treating with a particular matter, but what if you wanted to know how is the ministry dealing with all matters? And this is where you would find it. Again, it is being metered. At a very quick summary on the right, you can tell how many breaches are we tracking. Seven and three, 10 plus one, 11. You can see that one is fully compliant, seven are partial, and none is three. Nothing has been done. You would be able to get some, we haven't put that in as yet, but some budgetary information. Again, who the accounting officers are. And those 11 breaches would all be present on the page listed below. Yeah? And because this should contain the one about the 1.78 billion, you would find it also and you'll be able to take yourself right back to the beginning. Now, I'm going to close by saying that we can't go into that this evening, but the other tools for JAMP would include tracking the performance of who? Our members of parliament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you clapped, because it's not just a hall of shame. It's a wall of commendation. There are some members of parliament that's doing a stellar job. A stellar job. A stellar job. A stellar job. At another occasion, because we hope to launch in July, I would be able to take you into details as to how we plan to track it. But I also believe that this is going to trigger the conversation that we've been waiting on for the Prime Minister to talk to us about what? Job descriptions. So here it is, citizens prompting the conversation, and I believe we're going to move it right along. I'm going to close with leaving you with a, a, a snippet I saw in a newspaper. Those of us who are old enough would remember the public opinion newsletter. Um, but I was really struck by something somebody wrote. He called himself the seal, and he was looking prophetically ahead to things to come. And it really struck me, and I wanted to share it with you today. He said, the things to come are a people of courage and conviction in our politics, voters with the knowledge of their power and how to use it, more righteous deeds, Pat. <laughs> Less righteous talk. <laughs> a greater voice in government. A unified public opinion. A party to manifest it. And see that its voice is heard. Its needs are met. A loosening of our chains. A general awakening to our condition. A public will to battle for the betterment of them. Less preferences. Less monopoly. Less taxes. Would anybody like to guess when that was written? 
Hillary, anybody? 20, oh, no, you're showing me up now. What year was that? <laughs> anybody? 1950, says Donna. Anybody? I mean, think about what they're saying and see if you could position it. Bobby, Carol, Donna, Elombe. Aye, and the winner is. <laughs> it was the 10th of April, 1937. And I... Right before the labor riots. And I dare to say, Jamaica, that this is still as relevant today. And there's no shame in that because these are things that should still be relevant as we move along. So I'm hoping that this seal is speaking prophetically and we are actually going to meet. We are hoping. I want to thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Prince. Yeah. Mm -hmm.